most of the stuff that people like hate are things that were either fed to me or were, were mentioned in a meeting. And I'm not saying that's just to, you know, exonerate myself because a lot of times I do stay stupid shit. But um, that one, yeah, was just an organic moment that I think people could relate to. Yes. We're all marking out, bro. Hey, make sure to watch until the very end of the interview for your chance to win these bad boys right here. Autograph Funkos from Big Daddy Cool Diesel and woo, the nature boy. Well, I figured I had Vampiro on the show recently. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had to have his broadcast partner on the show as well. I'm doing great. Okay, that yeah. was good. That good was it. See you. Okay, Take care. Well, <laughs> bye. You're a broadcast professional. I, I should. Yeah, I play one on TV. Yeah, you no, do. I saw that that thing with uh, with Vamp. I thought it, I thought it was great. I thought it was great for people to see sides of him that maybe only us know. So right, no, and that ca that happened like the very last minute. Basically, I was in Las Vegas. Someone tweeted out, "Oh, Vampiro lives there. You guys should do an interview." Ten minutes later, we were like, "Okay, yeah, we'll make this thing happen." He's like Uber. <laughs> like you could just that's it you know i, I wish all the interviews your interview were like is that. three minutes away I, I wish it was like that uh, although this was this was good this I, was three minutes away yeah, yeah kind of it was like hey we should do an interview sometime and you're 100%. like let's do it and uh it's funny i, I said to you too I, i'll be honest with you uh i'm nervous and what I, because when you watch someone and you like like or you admire someone's work and you get to do something with them you want to be your best you know what I mean? There's certain times where you control a situation as an interviewer. I'm standing here with John Cena, whatever. But in this world, yeah. you're the Gene Okerlund, the guy. And I'm like, I, you know, I got to I don't know. Weird. <laughs> whatever. You're working with Impact now. Yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, so we're here in Las Vegas, Sam's Town Casino for the Impact tapings. And you're working backstage as a producer. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny because that term, so people will associate producer with what used to be called the agent. Yes. But in like, I guess the sports truck world, the producer actually sits in the truck and produces the entire show from open to here comes so-and-so's music in three, two, one, lose that, roll this graphic for season's beat downs and, and let's get out on a commercial. So that's what I'm doing in the truck there and that's fun. So you're, yeah, and I think there a distinction needs to be made there because the term producer is often a match agent or right. coach. Right. Yeah, you're like, you're on the production side of things. Complete, total aside. I'm yeah. Like, I should be like a union guy and have like black jeans. Oh, they're blue. <laughs> no, yeah, they're blue. blue. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> but no, and it's funny because people don't realize, and I've done now enough shows across the board from WWE to Lucha Underground, you know, these are MGM productions and WWE productions. The the grips and the guys that run cable and the guys that work the truck should be paid what the top guys are paid because nothing happens without them. <laughs> when you when you sit inside a control room or a truck for a wrestling show, it blows your mind what goes on. Yeah, and uh, just for all sports, so for all television, yes. if for we just television in general, yeah. take a step back and see how we view media, especially now mm -hmm. from television. Now it's like people record stuff. This isn't so much directed, but on television, there's someone pushing a button, oh, taking yeah. this angle, calling this coloring of this particular background. It's it's amazing to me. And it's like watching a director do their work, like ready one and take it, ready four, no, ready three, take three, ready five, no, take two. It's, it's insane. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. Yeah. I would be a terrible director. Seriously. Like, <laughs> like every camera was ready and then you took someone yeah, else's I did. shot. Ready five. Oh, we're going to take two instead. Yeah, zoom in on three. Yeah. No. Did your time in WWE prepare you for this production side of things? So uh, uh, <laughs> I spoke for a living. I became Sean Connery, evidently. Uh, <laughs> when I wasn't wrestling, when I wasn't doing anything, I could slip out to the back truck and the doors usually wide open. They're huge trucks. And if you find the right spot, you're standing behind like Kevin Dunn. And in the wrestling world, in the media world, that's standing behind Martin Scorsese. That's standing behind, insert great director, producer here. Sure. So I just was able to be over his shoulder watching. I did it because I enjoyed it. Did yeah. I have the idea, the travel and time, that it would prepare me for this? No, but I guess taking a genuine interest and then having the being fortunate enough to look over the shoulder of one of the arguably the best having the interest and having the experience of seeing him prepared me so it was just out of curiosity at first <laughs> like everything really yeah so just like what's this button do <laughs> 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 yeah. what's this button do <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah so it was just out of curiosity like i, I kind of wonder how the, the machine works back here yeah did you have a curiosity for other aspects of the wrestling world too 
it, it, take away the, the wrestling part just for how, like, this goes on here in Boston and a truck sends a satellite fuck, to my house in Long Beach, New York, and I can see that. Yeah. How that works, and I also realize there's a huge value in that. If you know how to do that skill, then that skill is, you know, it's supply and demand. A lot of people don't know how to do it. It becomes a commodity. They will pay you a lot of money for this skill. Yeah, yeah. So I, that, to me, is the biggest thing. Like, what, what skill can I learn? Love wrestling. Can tell you about it with my eyes closed asleep. And sometimes I do. I talk about wrestling in my sleep. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and enjoy it and make some, make some money on it. Where was the transition from in-ring to, you know, from the outside looking in for me as a fan, to you moving to commentary? The, there's a moment it's fucking this is how life is nuts because we try and plan 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 i'm gonna yeah. do this i'm gonna do that and you never know that one person mentions to you hey you know who's really good that so-and-so guy Pew. it's august 5th joey styles mentions in a meeting they needed a commentator for ecw and he just piped up hey you know who and i've said this pretty much knows a lot about wrestling and won't shut up how about striker and vince was like okay next thing that's how it happened wow. just like that and I remember Bruce Pritchard came to me. He's like, yeah, you got to be in Atlanta, I want to say, the next day. And I didn't prepare. I still brought my boots. I still bring my boots. It's just it's a habit. I'm working in a production truck. I do not need giant like wrestling boots to go through the <laughs> airport. But it just was less and less as far as the punching and kicking and more and more this. So when, when they moved you into the commentary spot, was there an audition? Was there like, let's try you out, you know, kind of like on these televised, uh, untelevised matches? It was never put to me as such. It honestly was, so I'm making it up. The doors open at 6, the show starts at 7. At 4, I sat down with, I want to say, Todd, maybe, I don't remember, and they put a match Todd on. Yeah, yeah, they put a match on, and they had us call it on the monitor to the truck. Yeah. And I got one or two things from, from the producer. Hey, don't say this. Try that. Okay. That was it. And I think the trial is by fire. Wow. If I, if I was... As awful as sometimes I thought I was, or people tell me I was, in the beginning, they wouldn't have kept me on. So I guess each week went by, you were passable, passable, or you weren't hard and offensive. <laughs> cool, you're something I don't have to worry about. Let me worry about John Cena's match with Adrian Adonis. That match never happened, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny, though, that you say, oh, you know, people tell me I was bad all the time. The funny thing about commentary, especially, is you're either the best or people are like, you're the worst. I mean, I listen, everyone's entitled to think, but I think the thing is, so it's funny you say that because I've met, there's been a handful of people that have come up to me at like convention and stuff like, yo, what's up? I fucking hate you. They'll tell you that? And I'm like, cool, like I've never met you. And I'm like, okay, give me two minutes in my head. Give me two minutes. And if you still hate me, I'm still not playing a character, then peace out. I'm good. Yeah. And two minutes, three minutes go by. And like, ah, you know what? Like, it's just, it's a character. Yeah. Every word... MVP is a friend of mine. He says an interesting thing to me. I think Ric Flair said it to him. I don't know. When you see uh, Tom Hanks walking down the street, you don't go, yo, dude, Forrest Gump. You go, no, Tom Hanks. Yes. You see Ric Flair walking down the street, you don't go, yo, yo, Richard Fleer, whatever. Yo, Ric Flair. Yeah. We wrestlers are the only people that are their secret identity. Yeah. So if you hate that guy, he's doing his job. But please don't hate, you know. Matthew, I didn't, you know what I mean? I'm a regular dude in a fucking sweater, but yeah. And you are actually are wearing a sweater. I am, I'm totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Show me off the, yes, thank you very much. When you're, when you're working for Impact in the role that you're working right now, do you think You have like, to wear a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the gimmick. Yes. Do you think like, well, I'd, I'd like to do some commentary. You know, it's funny, I can listen to Josh and Don continually, like in my ear, yeah. and People don't realize I, I learned from Josh. I Josh was there when I got there, and when I started doing commentary, Josh and I came like this. If people knew what Josh does, and I put this tweet out, if you understand what Josh Matthews does for Impact, you would every time you ever see him, you would shake his hand and say, "Hey man, can I buy you a drink?" Because dude, he does so much. Yeah, and his commentary is in, innately good because he came from the factory. You know, he knows how to put things over. And Don is is so unique in his references that yeah. people don't get and his, his monotone and his pedigree in the sport. That's important. Someone has to have a pedigree in the, in the sport to have credibility of the listener. So I look at those guys and I'm like, yo, right now they're good. If an opportunity pops up somewhere, fine. Yeah. Do you miss it? <sighs> um, sometimes. What, and what working with Impact has done for me, though, look, there was a minute where 
I, I didn't not love it, but every match was kind of the same. And every like, you know, there was, I was stuck in this quagmire of calling not so good wrestling. Not so great wrestling, wrestling that wasn't done so well. I don't know. I have a degree. I promise. I know how to speak. <laughs> But now I see. The master's degree, right? (laughs) Yeah. Now I see like all the stuff these guys are doing on every channel. And dude, I would love to call that stuff. Love to. How did the role with Lucha come together? (laughs) Uh, Bleh. I'm sitting at home, (laughs) lost my. No, because I have to take these memories back in the card catalog of my brain. Sitting at home. I'm on the right side of the couch. The fireplace is there. Bugging out because uh, the WWE thing was over. And, you know, you do math. How much money do I have? How long can I live with this much money without having to work and die? And I was bugging a little bit. Mm. And um, for me, it's just for me, I, I go to, like, faith. Faith is, like, just my thing. Dude, and I prayed. I was like, please. I was like, if, 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 it is, if it's your will and it's something, give me an opportunity. Give me something. And I prayed, prayed that prayer. And I'm not being funny or whatever. It was, like, 45 minutes later, phone rings. It's Krista Joseph, who's a friend of mine from WWE, he's yeah. a writer or whatever. And he was straight up honest. He's like, yo, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, sitting on the couch, what do you mean? Yeah. He's like, well, listen, uh, he's like, uh, we wanted Josh, and either Josh didn't want to do it or Josh couldn't do it, so you weren't our first choice. But, <laughs> seriously, that's how it's what he said. He's like, if you can get on like a flight to LA tomorrow, I'll be there. And one thing in wrestling I was always taught, you know, yes is always your first answer. Mm. Even if you can't do it, just say yes and figure out a way. Because if you're supposed to do it, it's going to be awesome. Yes, got on the plane, flew out there six hour flight landed got to the building and i think it was eric van wagner who came up and like shook my hand he's like yo you're coming in and on pinch for us we appreciate it wow and right there i was like all right do my job yeah and and leave him like wanting more costanza like just you know what i mean <laughs> so and i remember dude i wore like the stupid vest and the shirt that's the first episode go back and watch that in contrast to vamp yeah it was just like an you know, wow. odd couple dun, dun, dun. but uh that's how that came about that was that was crazy. I'm actually surprised that they didn't have this planned out weeks or months in advance. I think someone bailed. I, you know, I, I think it was just as far as casting. Uh-huh. Someone couldn't do the role. Yeah. And then they called the next actor. And I was the actor that they called and they got the role. I, I, I was such a big Lucha Underground fan. And I thought that you did... You did such amazing work there, not only carrying oh, the story, you. but like making us care about <laughs> what was going on in the ring, too. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's like a, the nicest compliment you could say. It's true. Uh, and I think that it was it was the chemistry that you and Vampiro had that I think that really carried the show. Or the hatred that you guys had for each other. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> come on. Come on. You have you have me on the ropes. Yeah, no, no, uh, 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 no. No, I know you guys really, you do like each other. Oh, um, the so anything in life, uh, I, you have chemistry with someone or you just don't. Sure. Just you and I could, could not. We'll know when this is done. We'll see what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Someone once explained to me something called a spiritual familiar, meaning if you believe in it, you knew this spirit somehow in your in your previous life, somehow in mm. cosmic dust world. First time I met Vampiro was I want to say 2002 for MLW. It was just hey, what's up? How are you? Cool, whatever. The next time I saw him was at Lucha Underground, and I'm telling you, when we sat down together, it's like, don't I fucking know you some somewhere? Aren't you my brought something huh. lights camera action go working 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 you know everything works and then from there we just became interesting interesting friends what ended up happening with lucha underground to my knowledge it started as needing a new home and You're, do you mean physical home as the studio or on the, the no TV no for, for, for presentation and platform okay. so i think it was, so not it was the el ray, ray yeah. or if anything el ray maybe couldn't finance the production or that they couldn't agree to get the price of production down to a number i was assuming that this particular company was comfortable with i understand it was shopped around to some other places whatever i don't know what happened with the netflix thing but i honestly think it just comes down to money mm. and blah. it's cuz it <laughs> Because it just kind of money and blah. It just kind of yeah. It just, just kind of kind of blah. went blah. It, like it, it dribbled it, out. It yeah. wasn't even good in the end. And then you started having guys working elsewhere, and then you started having more guys working elsewhere. And it's like I guess this isn't a thing anymore. You know when I so, I guess all of us hold on to something we yeah. don't believe is true. And and when I decided all right, that's probably going to not be something. Was fractured when the a lot of the talent and the company had like legal issues, and yeah. I I tried not to pay attention to like gossip i heard you did this i don't know that 
that to me was the first fracture. I was like, fuck, yeah. this ain't coming back. Yeah, yeah. At least not for now. So Right. Are you still wrestling? Yeah. Yeah. I just wrestled uh, from this taping a week ago at NYWC. Oh, so you're taking you're still taking a bunch of indie bookings? Not a bunch. Okay. No. Um, I do like to be at home. I really do. I'm at a point in my life where I enjoy being at home. I, I think it's interesting, though, because if there's like some younger fans watching this right now, they might not know Matt Stryker, the wrestler. That's true. And like, is there a is there a divide in your that career? Might be good for them. <laughs> no, come on. Is there a divide in your career when you started to realize that, like, oh, I think people are realize are recognizing me more as a commentator than they are a wrestler? It, it's an interesting question. I guess I'd have to have like a, an awareness or cognition of when people. So when I get stopped, I get so oh, I'm fucking socially awkward. Matt Stryker's like, hey, how you doing? Whatever. Matthew K? Mm, I'm super nice. Hey, how are you? And they go, Matt Stryker, what's your name? And people will always do this. They give me their full name, which is the weirdest thing really? in the world. It's the weird, like for a little kid, hey, Matt Stryker, hey, what's your name? You're Jeffrey Johnson. Oh, hey, Jeff. For a grown guy, like, hey, what's your name? Like, Donald Jenkins. Oh, hi, Donald. Nice to meet you. So uh, I don't really take an inventory of how people, how people uh, approach that, but. I could see how more would. There's a more widespread body of work for me as an announcer. So Also, you know, when you're an announcer, your voice is on the show for the entire show. Yeah. When you're a wrestler, you wrestle for a few minutes. See you next week. So I, can never, I can never really do, like, crank calls or anything. Cause ever, like the, I know this voice. Who is this? <laughs> so. We also hosted NXT when it was in a you know, very different that was fun. version of what it was. Yeah. You, you did a lot. <laughs> Thanks. That's great. I, it's fortunate, you know, and I think in any, in any walk of life, anyone that's, you're an accountant, you work at a gym, whatever, if you can l learn how to learn, right? Yeah. You can do a lot of different things. So I just learned how, John Lauren, I said, I learned how to learn. And I just learned how to learn stuff. And that makes you versatile and valuable. But you walk in the door as a wrestler yeah. When are you able to allow yourself or be allowed to start to learn those other things? I, I took it upon myself. I didn't wait for anyone to go, okay, you're now allowed to go sneak to the back of the truck and stand behind the executive vice president who may or may not even know your name of production. And if he does turn around, he backs his chair up, he farts, he knocks a coffee on me. I'm fired. So no one said, yeah, go sneak around the back. Yeah. No one said it. I used to sit, so there's, a, there's different rooms back in WWE backstage and one of the rooms is called like uh, pre-tapes and then there's this audio room that just has all the audio that's going on in the building. Hmm. Michael Cole and you know so-and-so's headset, whatever they're shooting over and things, sometimes even Vince's office. I would put those fucking head things on and just listen. No one said, go ahead, do that. It's okay. So yeah. I don't know. I just did it. I was weird. And I also didn't like to hang out and talk to people. <laughs> I can go hide in this room and put on headsets, be like, oh, he's working. Leave him alone. Well, do you... <laughs> working i'm avoiding you do you think your background in teaching made you want to be a student yourself yeah. in this stuff yeah definitely what was what exactly was it that you taught social studies okay what, yeah. what age what grade so, uh, grade seven through 12 so it's just adolescent uh, education and educational psychology how people learn i was always fascinated with that huh so and then look at you. Hey, and look a, at you. A student. A student. So th obviously the teaching job has to come to an end when WWE hires you? It has to. Did it? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, uh, it was a choice. The, everything was, happened for a reason. Again, back to faith. The, the, however, I lost that one job. It coincided right with that WWE contract. Like that. So again, to me, divine wind and... I'll just jump in the boat and go for the ride. With, with all the knowledge that you had in WWE and learning from a little bit here and there and everywhere, why didn't they renew your contract? I mean, if you're asking me, you're asking them. So, <laughs> uh, I, I watch a lot of things where people will say, oh, you know, well, they this, they that. So I put myself, my dad was smart to this for me. He said, put yourself in their shoes from business. So if you understand business and stocks, whatever, black is made money, red is lost money. Sure. What, did, what was I doing for them at that time? I was doing backstage interviews and maybe I was calling main event. Like, I don't even remember. I was doing stuff for like the app in its infancy. And they were paying me. I was there, you know, almost 10 years. So I was on like a second or third contract. I was doing well mm -hmm. 
for the amount of work, I was robbing them blind. So <laughs> when they wanted to, they came up to renew the contract. If they would have said, listen, here's the straight up. You do this much work. We pay you this much. Mm -hmm. We'll try to find work for you, but we got to bring you down here. I'd say, okay. Yeah. You're WWE. I love you. Hold me. But they didn't give me that option. They just said, listen, we're not renewing. Mm. Like I remember it was, it, I had to go up for like a, a contract talk. And, I mean, I was so young and stupid. I got put on a suit and I had to go to Stamford. And I, I've likened it before to that scene in Goodfellas where Joe Pesci walks in. He, ah, fuck. I walked in and right, uh, the guy I was supposed to meet with wasn't in the meeting. It was someone oh. else sitting on a desk with Lex Matthew. Come in. Ah, oh, fuck me. <laughs> All right, cool. And he's like, yeah, we're not going to renew it. Da, da, da. I was, that was, that was a, a punch in the gut. Fella, Especially yeah. they flew you to Connecticut to. Well, oh, I drove. You. I drove okay. up. I All drove right, up. Great. So they, yeah. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they bring you I into the to office to go. Yeah, we're not going to keep you around. Anymore. Cool. You could have called me. Yeah. But regardless, the opportunity to say, "Listen, here's business. Let's talk money." Yeah. You do this. We'll give you that. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks. Yeah. Still have a fucking job. Still have some whatever. Da da da. So, that was what it was. But I think that there's a reason. Again, I'm a faith guy. God took me from there for a reason. And now that I'm older, I can try to do inventory of the way I was, the person I was, the things that I was doing, and how they were negative to, to my life. Maybe sometimes it's better that I'm not there at, in that carnation of it as I remember it. So you go from being on the road every single week yeah. to now being at home. Yeah. You know, What was that transition like for you? Well, at first... you. <laughs> You have to, I had to get over the feeling of, a, I'm a failure. I did something for them to say, we do not want you. Yeah, yeah. That, that's rejection. That's whatever. So, okay, let me, let me deal with that internally and mentally. And, and I'll be honest, um, and I've spoken about it. I have, like, everyone has, I have to believe everyone has, like, just anxiety in situations. Like, that fucking inner monologue, that monkey on a unicycle banging cymbals in your head and when you talk to people, you go somewhere. That's all the time for me. Maybe that's why I fucking vamp and I get along. Uh, <laughs> so I had to navigate that. And then from there, my surrender goes to, just to prayer. All right, listen, take, where, take me where you're going to take me. Mm -hmm. I'm alive. Thank God. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I've got some money. I've got a roof over my head. I got food in the fridge. I'm going to go sleep upstairs tonight. Okay, God, I want to see what I can do for you tomorrow. Right. That's where that's at. It was faith something that was always part of your life from a young age? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember my dad on he, he lived in a, a tall apartment building he was out on a terrace in the morning early and i must have woke up and went to look for him and he was outside and i saw his mouth moving i'm a kid he comes back in i'm like can i have gum i've said this story before and he's like i don't have gum what are you talking about and i said like, no i saw you chewing gum outside i wasn't chewing gum i was talking he was on the 17th floor of a 17 story building over there i'm like who are you talking to yeah so i was talking to god i was like what is that come my son sit upon my lap and let me tell you these tales and the good thing about how he did it was he's, he showed it to me. And then he let me, he never pushed anything. Mm. No one ever did. He's like, just, you want to go read about that experiment? Think about that? Go ahead. Mm. And from there, I just grew to, it's so like organized religion. I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Stand up, sit down. Six Hail Marys. Here's your bar mitzvah. You win. I don't know how it works. But whatever. And I'm not, I'm not mocking it. But, yeah. But beyond all that, what I arrived, and then I started taking classes at college, what I arrived at is, regardless of what they tell you you are, you're a Muslim, you're a Christian, you're a, do you believe in right and wrong? Do you believe in good and bad? Mm. Do you believe that there is some feeling between humans and animals and nature? Then, okay, that's what the world calls God. But to me, I was like, okay, you believe in that good. Mm. How much you choose to do outside of that is on you. So that's what I started to develop. So faith has been there for from that beginning. Is does that something that works into your wrestling in any sort of way? Lord, grant me the strength to punch this man <laughs> with an amazing Superman punch I've seen and the crowd guys, pop. I've seen guys pray before they go out. But that I think is more for I know for me when I do it, it's A, oh my God, thank you so much that this is my life. Oh, so this is gratitude. B, yeah. I want to be safe and I, and I want him, usually him to be safe. And I do this weird thing. I'm like, and please, if his family there, is anyone that's there where he, where he can, you know, shine for them. Let me, I, Johnny Rods is my trainer. Mm -hmm. So the term is jobber or carpenter. He's like the ultimate go in and lose guy. Yeah. You know, the guy who gets his introduction when you're not on television. But 
that's a very noble thing. What can I do for you? It's almost akin to the servant in most faiths, whether it be Jesus, whether it be uh, Muhammad, whether it be Buddha. They have some type of servitude to something. Right. So how can I serve you in this match? So there's that, and then please don't let me fucking die. <laughs> Every time some of these guys pick you up, I mean, I'm not a big dude. You know, I'm not six feet tall. I'm not like 215 now. But dude, when Bobby Lashley picks you up, yeah. all you can hope is to land right. And I mean, bless his heart. For his strength and stuff, he's such a professional where he just puts you where it's perfect. Mm. I think one of the things that I appreciated so much about your commentary is you came across like such a fan. Like you were so... Yeah. Well, you were obviously, obviously very knowledgeable about what was going on, but you came across like genuinely interested in what was going on. And of course, the moment of like, I'm marking out, <laughs> Stan, I'm marking out, bro. Yeah. Fans love that. What was the reaction from Vince or from production on that? Um, the only produ uh, reaction I think I recall was Michael Cole. And the good thing about Michael Cole is he would always give you these like visuals. So it's either a wink or a... I don't matter. And that's you those are uh silent cues. Sure. And when I said that, he like he looked at me for a split second and then it was like, cool. And went right back to it. So that was the only reaction I got. I think the reaction is more on the outside than on the inside. I mean people are still talking about it I now. Don't I don't know. I don't know. Cool. And that <laughs> was just a that was in that moment, that was just a genuine reaction from you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think because so many of my, when, I, when I'm left to my own devices, I don't know, I, I'm all right. Most of the stuff that people like hate are things that were either fed to me or were, were mentioned in a meeting. And I'm not saying that's just to you know, exonerate myself because a lot of times I do stay stupid shit. But um, that one, yeah, was just an organic moment that I think people can relate to. Yes. We're all marking out, bro. So. But I, I don't think people realize that a lot of time when you're on commentary, you are having stuff fed to you. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to call the match while someone is in your ear telling you what to say or there, suggesting there's, there's something. There's conversation going on. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's as, you know, I don't know, it's harmless as, hey, let's not forget that the story here is, you know, Jenny's arm. Right. And then sometimes it's, why would you say that about so-and-so's neck when the blah, 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 and the, that's not the time for that conversation. Yeah. That conversation should come later, but I didn't really get a lot of that. But I, yeah. I know from working in TV my entire career with an IFB oh, in. excuse me. Sorry, yeah, my hair's not IFB. long to do that. Yeah. But we, yeah, with that in your ear, it's so hard to concentrate on what you're doing when there's another voice speaking to you. <laughs> so... I had to, and don't ask me why, I think it was like a rib or a joke on me. I had to read teleprompter with an IFB no. in with someone talking oh, to me. Oh, that's so hard. I, I, don't, ask us, don't ask me how, and I'm sure you do it too. Yeah. You, don't, you don't know how you get through it. But at the end, you go back, you're like, yeah, I did that, and I had a 96% you know, success rate. I maybe flubbed one line, or I, didn't, I missed the point somewhere. So, I, I, I feel like in those situations, there's, failure's not an option. In those situations, especially when you're live, yeah. you're reading Make a teleprompter. Happen. Make it happen. You just have to. And if you flub up, you mess something up, you just make it sound like that's what you were supposed to be doing. You have no choice because it's presentation. Television, just presentation. Just go out there and say some words and maybe we'll throw some graphics over your face and we're out. <laughs> that's you're, right. Here's some money. In, in the job that you're in now, in the role that you're in now, what are some of the mistakes that maybe you see people making in the ring. I think I say, what are some of the mistakes you've made? And I was like, <laughs> how much time do you have? But th that's, it's interesting. My thought process went right there because uh, <sighs> making mistakes is great, are great. It's great. And we, uh, we, we what, bemoan and lament, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. Dude, I, sometimes I love like seeing mistakes because if you can learn from them, you get better. Mistakes that I see out there, I, I don't think I can critique it as a, as a whole. I think for the most part, it's just what anyone would say. It's not about, it's basic psychology. Basic psychology. I, you have to have an emotional investment in me. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no matter what I do, you don't give a shit. Right. So that's the first thing. And how do you do that is with pacing. If, if, if guys would make believe, sorry, that sometimes some of those shots hurt more than they do. And sometimes the ones that fucking kill you don't even look like they yeah. were anything. But if a guy would sell, just a, just a touch more. There's still sympathy left in this world. Mm. The world's changing, but there's still sympathy. People still have, humans still have a heart. 
So if you could play on that, your, your matches and the products will be so much better because instead of sitting here and watching it, we sit here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I love so and so. Yeah, yeah, As opposed yeah. to, I've seen Stryker. What is he gonna do now? That rolling armbar thing? Okay, cool. All right, point to your head. I know you're smarter than me. Hey, listen, can we go? Yo. Well, if you, if if your brain immediately did go to the mistakes that you've racked <laughs> up, what's the what do you, you think is the biggest mistake that you've made, and what did you learn from it? In this producing thing? Just in general, maybe. In life? Sure. Or Fuck. maybe it's in the ring. Maybe it's in con commentary. Okay. Uh, okay. Big, I think biggest mistake or one of for me at this point in my life, and if it could help anyone, hold your tongue a, two seconds longer than you want to. Hmm. Even, even the fool seems wise when he is silent. Um, William Regal says, a still tongue keeps a wise head. There are times where I literally, in situations where people are talking, and I, I want to jump in. I want to say, I go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because it gives me time to think, what was I going to say? Process what they said. Let them finish what they're going to say. And it just allows me to be a better part of the interaction as opposed to jumping in and missing everything they were going to say. Hmm. You can't do that on commentary, though. You know something? You can. J JR taught me. There are times, Vince, too. It's called laying out. There are times where silence tells a brilliant story because the natural sounds of the ring. Hearing uh, Michael Elgin's clothesline thud against Eddie Edwards' chest tells everyone in the world... Independent of language, culture, race, creed, diversity, that shit hurt. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing I can say that's going to, you know, expand on that. Yeah. Are you still teaching? At this moment? I mean, uh, at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. just, I just finished a, a degree in, a, in a educational psychology, so there are opportunities wow. if I, you know. What kind of degree? To, so it was a master's in educational psychology. It's, wow. Uh, it was good. I mean, I had to get it and I wanted to get it. So I can, it allows me to like pursue other things. And once you start getting like certificates and degrees and da da da, they go here. You're know, like, money. <laughs> oh, just put on this shirt and point to this and say this. Cool. I can go home. Cool. But yeah, so that's, that's fun. It's fun to see how people learn and how kids are coming up these days. It's cool. Do you mean the opportunities to maybe be a professor at a, a I've college about or something? It. I, I mean, halfway there with the you thing. do wear the sweater, yeah. I've thought about it, and there's like I want to say there's over a dozen, uh, four years and two years in a, in a community college, or in my area. So if you imagine, you can imagine Matt Schreiber yeah, yeah. retires to be like a professor of European history at Nassau Community College. I teach Tuesday and Thursday. What do I teach? Let me think. You know what? Yeah, what would you I teach? I teach two to four. Now in the summer, the summer I'll, I'll, I'll teach summer and I'll go to the beach. Yeah, I'll teach two to four. I'll let you out at 3.45. Don't tell anybody. What a, uh -huh. what a professor. Uh, maybe we do Friday one to three, but sometimes on Fridays, on Thursdays, I'm like, yeah, listen, we're not coming in. Everything's, I everything's email. Now. I appreciate that these are all afternoon classes. Yeah, yeah. Who, Every, you want to take a 7.45? Any, Everyone's breath smells. I don't care who you are. student watching this right now knows you don't go to a class before like 10 a.m. But I'm just saying, like anything to me that happens early in the morning, I feel that I smell this mixture in the air of like hot hunger and coffee breath. And no matter what you're saying, who you are, I you're so fresh out of the shower, I smell your cologne just a little bit more. Your hair gel. Mornings are very weird to me because the senses are heightened and I, I'm a germaphobe. People are, I don't know, I don't want to breathe your air. <laughs> Fuck. I just, you know, some people, some people smell. Have bad breath. All right, so you're going to have afternoon classes. Afternoon but, classes to avoid that. <laughs> but for real, do you think with, with the extra education you've been getting, the opportunities, are they in education? Are they in, are they in teaching? Or are they in other jobs? It's a great question because I think the goal was to let me have as many avenues of opportunities as I can because I was once at a point where the only avenue really closed. And I had to like, you know, literally fall to my knees and turn to prayer. And in that, reward of here's a new avenue i was something said to me yo man dig out a few more avenues so that if these close off wrestling goes away that you have these and right now i'm fortunate thank god that these avenues are open and these avenues are open and i can take streams of income or experience and get to where i want to be in my life mm. so it's, it's like you said you've learned to learn <laughs> yeah fuck it's, it's the only thing i've learned so if we what what degrees do you have uh, um, <laughs> um, I have uh, <laughs> I have degrees. 
So what is it? It's a bachelor's in secondary ed history, and then it's the master's in educational psychology. So there's another, you know, Luchasaurus talks about having a master's degree. <laughs> Matt Stryker has I mean, a master's it degree, It doesn't too. mean anything. With online courses these days, you can do it, too. I guess anyone could do it yeah. if they wanted to. Yeah. Who was it that approached you about the current job that you have now? Oh, that's Scott. Scott Tamore. And... <laughs> It's, uh, you see the same people, the saying in wrestling is, ah, you see the same people going up the ladder as you do going down, you know, and you're on your way up. You should be nice people because you ain't going to be there all the time. You don't know how high up that ladder you're going to get. Sure. And if you're a dick, you're coming tumbling down. Scott and I have, you know, always gone along swimmingly. And uh, he's always tried to find positions for me at Impact. And then finally this came a, a boot. And uh, <laughs> it just, it seems to work because I think you kind of got to know wrestling. Mm -hmm. Know what the announcers are doing. Know what the TV audience is going to see. And time is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in any kind of televised thing, segments of time, as we look at the clock, is import are important. So those things, all that comes from Scott DeMore. And it, was he the one who trained you how to do this? <laughs> trained you? <laughs> trained you? Listen, they go, hey, do you think you can? And you go, yeah, sure, I can. Because yes is always the yes first always answer in wrestling. Uh, but uh, to, to his credit... Sometimes being left to your own devices is a good thing. Sink or swim. Mm -hmm. And having the knowledge to do it. And I was super fortunate to have certain people like uh, the, the director, Dave Zahadi, and uh, you know, like I said, Josh Matthews and Jimmy Jacobs, and the relationship with Scott, and being able to talk to people. And there's a few other guys in the truck that are just so valuable. So you learn to learn. Hey, how do I need to learn how to do this? Instead of going, excuse me, can you press that button for me so I can talk to Josh? It's, hey, man, you got two seconds. Can you show me which button allows me to talk to Josh? Oh, you got to flip that one over there. Well, why'd you do that? Well, you got to put on monitor three. You got to make sure his monitor's on. And you got to flip. You know what? That fucking makes sense. It doesn't right, have to be circular. Right, right, right. Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man a fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. Yeah. Thank you for teaching me to fish. Peace out. Yo, Josh, it's mad. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah. So you're the guy in, in the announcer's ears. Yes, now I'm the guy <laughs> fucking yelling. No, I don't yell. Ever, 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 ever. ever. It's, all come, it's all come full circle here. And interestingly enough, though, you sometimes things happen in your life and you say, hey, I always want to be like that. Or, right. you know what? I'm never going to be that way. So some of the things that I've heard more than I've experienced, to be honest, I some things I didn't like, I am very aware of not being that guy here. It's sort of, hey, you know, excuse me, camera two, or please, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was raised, say grace, say ma'am, say thank you. That's just me. Hmm. So I think it's nice. I don't know. Fuck you. It, <laughs> if you've learned to learn, what do you think is the biggest lesson that wrestling has taught you? You're proud of that question. You, you gave just, that one. I just, <laughs> I just came around to that one, yeah. Wait, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's, what do you think is the biggest wrestling lesson that you've learned? What's the biggest life lesson that wrestling's taught you? Yeah, I mean, that, that, definitely that first one of the still tongue keeps a wise head. Yeah, but, okay. um, fuck, there's so many. I look back on it, and it, it, it blew by, and I was super fortunate. And it's then, not done, though. It's not. It's yeah. not. But, I mean, listen, it's half my life. Literally half my life. I've been doing this, uh, 20, it'll be 22 years. Like, yeah. Half of my existence is this in some regard. I have to have some awareness of how has that changed me as a human being from before I ever got into it. Yeah. How'd that change seven-year-old Matthew? I started watching when I was seven, so maybe I did this metamorphosis, this change from caterpillar to butterfly has been this, this, this you know, journey. And now I have to say, well, how much more time do I have? I have no idea. No one does. And will this thing be with me my entire time or will there be a portion of my life where... That was. So, yeah. I mean, fuck, I'm lucky and I'm grateful. Not the biggest guy, not the best wrestler. I could talk. Yeah, you know, I'll admit, I could, yeah, I could, you could I talk. Could, yeah. yeah. And if that's enough, thank, thank God. But kid comes from fucking Queens, New York and does that and wrestles Kurt Angle and all that shit. To me, it's got to be, I just give it up to, I don't understand it. Thank you, God. What can I do with this opportunity to serve you? Mm -hmm. And I think that I look back. A lot of times people come up to me, dude, I talk to a lot of kids, a lot. And when you say like stupid shit, like, hey man, stay off drugs. Yo, don't, beer's bad for you. All right, I'll see you, man. Do good in school, okay? Do well. That means more to them than their parent telling it to them every day. Yeah. So if there was one kid that was like, you know what? I'm not going to do heroin because Matt Stryker told me not to. Cool. There's the big lesson. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what we got. But I also think that I think your character worked so well 
when you first came into WWE because it was so much of who you were. You know, it was, you were basically teaching people. And I think that because you were so good at that, it then made your character. The jury's still out on that last part. <laughs> it made your character work that much better. I, I think to Vince McMahon's credit, to Stephanie's credit, they borrow from real life because it's the easiest thing to emulate. A lot of times, and you see it now with a lot of the wrestlers, they look great and they're awesome, but when they're asked to be this character, mm. it comes, it's hard to watch. It's, I'm embarrassed for them. And when I get you the 23rd in Shreveport, it's gonna be your end. Like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Fuck, does everything have to be so like that? And the lighting cue, and you hit your pose, and you say your phrase, and you wear your T-shirt. I don't know. There's a part of that that I think is just feels wonky. Mm. I don't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> no, but it's, it, it makes sense, though, because for you it wasn't wonky because it was like, oh, you just want me to take this classroom-type persona and then turn it up to 11, Fucking 11 and kind of act like an asshole. That's it. And they let me write a lot of my own like uh, pieces. And that very rarely happens. I was uh, at Stephanie. I was fortunate. After like a second or third one, I remember I was working with Dusty Rhodes and, and Paul Heyman in Buffalo, New York, locked away in a room working on a segment for like dot com. But sometimes you look back and you're like, either A, that was a test, or B, I just happen to be fucking locked in a room with Dusty Rhodes and Paul Heyman working on, like, are you kidding? I'm going to come out so much differently than I went in. Yeah. And if you look at the learning tree of wrestling, which is my favorite thing to do, um, but Paul learned from Dusty, right? So Tommy Dreamer is one of my dearest friends. So Tommy learned from Paul. Paul learned from Dusty. Dusty mm -hmm. learned from Eddie Graham. And Eddie Graham is arguably one of the greatest bookers in all the world. So when I think about that, I was in a room with these two fucking dudes. Yeah. After that night, uh, somebody was like, all right, you can write stuff, submit it, and we got to approve it, and we can move from there. And I had fun with that. Man. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I've talked to so many different people that talk about how great Dusty was and how much Dusty developed their characters. It's like he was just so special. That's the right word. Um, Dusty reminded me of my dad. Dusty had a soul. Like a soul, you felt, you believed that he loved you to death. When he hugged you, he hugged you. He didn't, you know, what's going on, yo? You know, he didn't give you that hard, but he, you were enveloped in Dusty, that love. Um, and yeah, he definitely was a special human being. Hmm. Yeah. When you look back at your career, what's the one match that you really love, that really stands out for you? So the right answer is, oh, you know, the stuff with Kurt Angle. Sure. And at, at the end of the day, I will be a, a wrestler, and I'm, I'm coaching um, junior high wrestling at one of the local uh, high schools by me. So, you know, all, all that stuff has always been in my DNA. So the fact that I was able to go in there with him yeah. and roll to the point where he would, you know, allow me to make it look like I was hurting him for a little while, you know. <laughs> Got him, right? <laughs> Fucking ankle, huh? But after a while, you have to get better just touching him, yeah, touching his robe. Uh, but there are other matches that people may not. So I, there was this guy, Josh Daniels, in, in New York and New Jersey when I was first starting out. We wrestled each other every weekend, and it, it's not right, but we beat the f out of each other in a loving way. And we just had these, um, these matches that were, were great. And then uh, I had a match with Low Key once who to me still to this day and he also had a hand in training me 22 years later the world should know his just his character his talent his yeah. ability to captivate the the ability for you to put down the remote and everything professional wrestling is supposed to be loki can bring you for not just 8 to 12 minutes yeah. he can bring it for like 30 45 60 minutes and that character is so real and it's one of the last ones so matches match i had it with him also uh stands out he he works in a, such a believable way because it's real enough to not be considered what it's just this he's special yeah he has some special people in the world i'm not saying key key if you're out there he's hitting you 
And there are times where if he is, if this is the place where you're supposed to hit him and you're not there in a way that is believable, yeah. you're not hitting him, even though well, we talked about it in the back. I was supposed to hit you. Oh, you left me standing there for 16 seconds. Uh, your voice isn't deep enough I to will be. kick okay. you now. <laughs> but And to me, that commitment to the integrity of what this sport still is and what it was in a way founded on was bastardized for a while but has and will always be about it's just that suspension for one little second mm -hmm. that yo either a if i ran into him out on the street i wouldn't want to fuck with him mm -hmm. and b he's kicking that guy's ass mm -hmm. and that guy's got to kick his ass back to me loki is one of the few that has maintained that throughout the trajectory of his career Mm -hmm. He's never departed from that. He never, you know, even when the, he did Caval, he was never fun, low key. No, he wouldn't. Yeah, he yeah. would never compromise his integrity uh, for his commitment to the integrity of the sport. And I always admired that. I, I, uh, I think that anytime Loki's in the ring, I, all eyes are on him because, yeah, yeah he, you're right. He does he does some special work in there. Yeah. What's uh, what's your take on everything that's going on in Impact Wrestling right now? I feel like you, you guys are making some real waves. Yeah, I think it's the the ability to think forward and to understand that uh, you know why why all the people. This is the thing that gets me. They'll say three ways to talk about wrestling in a promo, and it's my favorite because you'll see some of these wrestlers. You know, they get into their promo stance, and they'll either say industry or businesses. In this industry, I'm the top guy. Okay, or you know, I'm gonna get you out of this business. Sport. I think Impact understands that it can be sport, and the, the ebb and flow of the storyline of sport has to develop based off of the ability of the athlete. Hmm. So with guys like Michael Elgin and a guy who's become one of my favorites, Josh Alexander, I, he's, again, in the vein of the Kurt Angle, and I grew yeah. up loving William Regal, Fit Finley, Dean Malenko, you know, these guys. Josh Alexander's right there. You have to think about what it means for the wrestling. The wrestling is very good right now in Impact, and uh, that's what I first thing I noticed. No, and I think that... Not that it wasn't then, but it's, you know. No, and I think that... Uh, I mean, Tessa Blanchard made history, and I think that uh, it's not just it's not the men's championship or the women's championship; it's the world championship, and Tessa's one of the best wrestlers in the world. See, that's the thing, and when you look at it as a sport, um, from an athletic point of view, from size and weight and whatever, then you would just have to put Tessa in a category of world champions, independent of gender, that are at her height, at her weight, with her style. Sure. And I mean, immediately, I mean, I would think maybe a, a younger uh, American Dragon, uh, Brian Danielson, you know, a different kind of style, but still the same make and mold. Mm -hmm. And look at it as an athlete, forget gender. Uh, and, and other wrestlers, uh, not so much the style, but uh, Jody Fleisch. You know, think of the, the smaller, thinner wrestler that was still incredibly effective. Zack Sabre's a little taller, but he could also be a version of a Tessa. So she has the abilities. The thing about her, I think, is there's, there's that. I, gotta, I want to, there's two words that are coming to my mind. I can't use either of them because I have four sisters. But I'll use one. She has bitch in her. And that's a little something that, uh, if you want to put it on the gender thing, Man can have you. Yeah, I'm a dick, but what do you? What would you r less rather deal with? Lack of a yeah, I don't want to deal with that guy. He's a dick. Or, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. want to deal with her. She's a bitch. Mm. So there you go. And I have four sisters, and I love I, it's the, just, the three it's that a, are alive remain. So. It's a certain and the last one. I love you too. <laughs> I miss you. It's a certain aggression that that Tessa brings. A certain pa I mean, obviously passion that she brings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that, that that is a that's a that is an endearing word also to describe her. I think it's the right word. Yeah, no, you have to search for the right word. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this. Have you? Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, thank you. I was a little nervous too at the beginning. Yeah. Why? Tell me things about me. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you ever get people that you have to be aware of that in 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 casual conversation? I often look for when people fish. For things. Yeah. So a lot of times, people, some people are great about it. They can bring a conversation back to being about themselves. Sure. And sometimes in wrestling, you see that with like wrestlers and stuff. So that just reminded me of that. No, there, there are definitely times in those wrestling conversations when you're like, uh-huh, okay, yeah. You, you know. You know. Uh, you know. Uh, Matt Stryker, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you. 
Well, there we go. Thank you for checking out this chat with Matt Stryker and a huge thank you to Matt for making that interview happen. What a journey he's been on from high school teacher to WWE to commentator for WWE, commentator for Lucha Underground. And now he's bringing all of that knowledge to impact wrestling. And I just love his mindset and I appreciate that he's applying that to the world of professional wrestling. Uh, if you checked out my last interview with Excalibur, you know that I was Chris Van Beard during that interview. And as you can see now, I'm back to being Chris Van clean shaven. If you follow me on Instagram, you saw this because you know you can't just shave down a beard from beard to nothingness in just one stage. So you gotta do something like this. This is six stages of CVV with some really strange looking faces in there. Also, if you follow me on Instagram, at Chris Van Vliet, you saw this, boom, your chance to win these autographed Funko Pops from Dark Parlor Originals, autographed in person by Big Daddy Cool Diesel, and from, woo, the nature boy himself, Ric Flair. If you're not following me, this is your chance to win these bad boys, because the winner's gonna get both of these. Yeah, so follow me, at Chris Van Vliet. You'll see the post with these. Follow me, follow Dark Parlor Originals, tag a friend, like the photo. It's just that simple. And then someone's gonna get these autographs from both these legends, Hall of Famers, right there. Also a little bit of a personal announcement. I don't get personal that often on YouTube, but uh, this is gonna be the last one of these you see from this area right here. I'm packing up the car, moving to LA next week. So if you live in the California area, we just became best friends. So let me know which independent wrestling companies I need to check out in the LA area or the Southern California area. Also, let me know which wrestlers from that area should be on the show. Woo! Since we had Ric Flair, I got a woo, right? So looking forward to it. We'll see you on the next video. Chris Van Cleanshaven, out.